first class that we'll have where we're not actually setting up tools and doing administrative crap, right? So we'll actually get to just coding right off the get-go today, which is good. But just a couple of things we have to go over before we do that. So one, um, I noticed that because I review the recordings as I go through, the very low mumbling sound of people talking when I'm talking is coming through the recordings really bad. And you can hear them. And it's super annoying because then I have to try to figure out how to get my voice louder than your voice in the recording. I think it would just be much easier that if you want to have a conversation with your neighbor or talk to your friends, which is totally your adult choice, um, if you could just leave, do that outside the class or, you know, use Slack or Discord or Skype or Facebook Messenger or whatever to just kind of text each other. That way it's nice and quiet. You can hear me speak. People aren't trying to hear me over you, that kind of thing. Just as a respect thing, all right? Uh, so, yeah, so get past that awkward bit. Let's talk about the project that I just put online. So if you go to Blackboard, you'll see it there. And it might seem quite large, but it's actually not that bad. All right, so you'll notice there is part one, two, and three. The due date for this is the 26th or 27th, sorry, of October, which is literally the Sunday of reading week. So you guys go on reading week, you have the whole week off. That Sunday, you have this project due. Now, that being said, today is the 24th, 25th. So you have over a month to complete it. Now, I know people, I know what will happen. You'll wait till reading week, and then remember you have this thing, and then you'll start it, and you'll likely be way too far behind to be able to get it. Well, you should be able to get it done within reading week. That being said, it depends on how well you understand the course material. Um, first of all, let's talk about each piece to help alleviate some kind of stress that you're probably developing over the different sections here. So part one, which is worth uh, 10%. They're all worth 10%. Each part's worth 10%, 10% of work. Part one, super simple. Open up a Google Doc, add a nice little title, you know, make sure you're not using like Comic Sans font, that kind of thing, right? Talk about your project. Talk about who your group members are, what you're going to incorporate in your project, what you're trying to do with your project, how you plan on to meet each of the requirements in your project, right? And... I think total, it might be a couple of pages long. That's it. And most of it will be just lists and stuff. So it shouldn't be too much. Shouldn't be too hard. Or open up a Google slide deck like, and write a slide deck, which will take you even shorter time. And then you can just use visual aids and little blurbs to explain what you're going to do in your project. Be creative. Take, take a chance. You don't get many creative classes in this program. So be creative. Um, so that's worth 10%. Basically, you're going to talk about what sections you're going to authenticate you're going to re be required to authenticate at two levels. So you guys are going to learn role authentication in this class, which is super important because role authentication is what you'll be implementing most of the time, more time than not. And what the idea of role authentication is, is that a user at a various role will have access to different sections than a user at another role. So if you think about a general user versus an administrator, right? General user obviously can't view a list of all the users in the system, but the administrator can, and the administrator can actually um, manage those users, right? Whereas the general user, if they're going to manage anything, it'd be just be themselves, just their profile. Or they might be able to manage some personal content. It's like Facebook, right? There's Facebook admins, that can go in and help you retrieve lost photos, that can modify your site or your account, help you with your account details and stuff like that. But then there's you, right, who can only affect your account, right? So we're going to talk about role authentication next week, uh, unless we get into it today, but that's very doubtful. Um, so the other thing is that you're going to have is you're going to talk about uh, what pages are going to be authenticated and by who. Uh, you're also going to talk about what pages are just generally public, right? So you will have like a public homepage that people hit. Now, that being said, maybe only your homepage is public, right? Maybe all the really good stuff requires a person to register to view, right? So you're going to look at that. You're going to figure out which pages you're going to want to do it. And I, the 
idea is open to you. So you come up with an idea. Now I'm going to tell you right now, I'm going to wind up with 16 bookstores because that's always what I get, bookstores. I don't know why it's always bookstores. Try to be a little bit more unique. Be a little more original. Don't just give me a bookstore. Don't give me a bank, <laughs> right? Those are easy. Try to think outside the box a little bit and come up with something different. And like I said before, when you think outside the box and you come up with something different and you implement technologies that we haven't necessarily discussed, I award that usually with bonus marks, up to 20% in this class, actually, and bonus marks for thinking outside the box. Part two. Part two is actually starting the programming part of it. So you're going to implement user authentication. You're, this is going to be super, 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 super easy because we're literally, literally going to build this next week, the whole thing, in one class. So you'll have it already. So you'll take it out of your project, out of, out of what we're doing here, implement it into your project, classify it as done, and submit it because it's done. That'll be finished. So this part, super easy. Take no time. We're going to literally build it in class. Part three, however, we're going to build things that are like it. So you'll understand what a parent-child relationship with resources is uh, and how that actually works. You'll learn how to be able to pull records when they have that kind of relationship using uh, PHP, uh, and then the CRUD pieces. We're going to be doing CRUD uh, one, two, three, four times. We'll be doing four or five times because we'll have about five resources. So the whole idea of how CRUD works, how to set up a resource, and how to get that into your MySQL database and how to manipulate it with PHP will be old hat. By that point, by the end, by the time you're done, you'll be able to create a brand new resource in PHP in a heartbeat. All right, and this one, this is subject to us learning it. So the ability to upload a file or image, if we don't get to it, I will remove it from the rubric. Okay, so you, it won't be required. We should likely get to it. It doesn't take much, but we are quite a bit behind. Um, we're not quite going at the pace I was hoping to. Uh, we're quite a bit behind. This last piece, all partials layouts must be completed with a common design framework implemented. So common design frameworks, you guys have already used one, uh, Bootstrap. I believe almost everybody who had the HTML class learned Bootstrap. Um, so Bootstrap's acceptable. There's also materials, there's foundation. These frameworks don't take long to learn, they take a couple hours maybe to actually learn them. It might take a, a year to master them, but we're gonna be using Bootstrap in class anyways. So you'll get full experience with Bootstrap. And today we're actually going to implement Bootstrap directly. So, so that'll be good. Um, so each part is worth 10%. I was going to create individual due dates, but I thought, you know what? We'll just leave it open-ended. You have to the 26th to complete it. You know, do it on the weekend of the 25th and <laughs> hand it in for the Friday. Or to the 27th, sorry. Um, any questions about this stuff? Any questions about the project that you need to know? So yes, you are allowed to work in groups of up to four people, okay? I will put out a little disclaimer for that. I just didn't have time because I wrote this up before we started class today, okay? The rubric is there. So if you actually click on the project title, you can see there's a view rubric button there. Just click on view rubric, and there's a breakdown of what each part is worth and everything that is expected through there, all right? So just take your group of four people, three people, two people, or yourself if you want to do it solo, um, and then kind of split up what each person is going to do. Yeah, man. Sorry? No. Four. No. Four. <laughs> four because even four stretching it. I used to do three, but I had so many people that were like, but we got a fourth friend. He feels left out. <laughs> so I was like, fine, we'll do four. No, sorry. Poor guy. <laughs> Why don't you just split your group in half? Three and two, do that instead. All right. Okay, so we've got the project piece. Any questions about the actual project part? If you do have questions, email, Slack, right? Or just see me after class or before class. Feel free to stop me if you see me and talk to me about it and we can discuss it further. Cool. So what are we gonna do today? Well, the unfortunate thing is I have input validation and authentication. It was originally scheduled for today, but if you click on it, you'll notice it's absolutely empty. That's because we haven't hit that part yet. There's no point in talking about it until we get the other stuff done. 
So in order for us to do input validation and authentication, we need to actually be able to create a user. So we still need to create, we still need to solve two steps that we haven't solved yet. We have our index file where we can see all of our users, um, but we don't have the ability to show one user and we don't have the ability to create a brand new user. So we need to complete that before we can actually move into the authentication and input validation part, okay? <clears throat> All right, cool. So uh, why don't we get to that? So let's, um, let me close that off. Oh, I'm already in Windows, cool. Let's open up our file explorers and we'll just click on the comp 1006 directory there. Right. If you don't have it over to the side, we're going to navigate to it by going to the C drive, WAMP64, and the www directory. And you'll see the Comp1006 folder there. Now, some people have the ability to right click on it and choose to open with code. Some have Visual Studio hooked up to it. Some have Atom or brackets. And if you have that and you want to open it up in your favorite ID and it's an option, feel free to just click on the open with code to open it. Now I don't want to open the whole Comp1006 directory because it's just a bunch of files. I'm actually going to only open the one that I'm working on. And the one I'm going to work on today is the one we created last week, which was lesson three. We'll just continue in that folder for now. So go ahead and open up the lesson three folder that we created last week. <clears throat> I have no idea what these files are that we currently have open. All right, one other thing, I don't know if I showed you guys how to do this. I showed the other two classes for sure. But in here, you see this Comp1006 directory. If you click one directory up and go to the www directory, if you right click on the Comp1006, you can actually pin it to your quick access menu, which makes it a lot easier to get a hold of because then all you have to do is click on Comp1006 and you're immediately in the directory with all of our lessons. Did I show you that last week? I don't remember. Oh, okay, so cool. I have a great memory, it's just really short. All right, so last week we took our Comp1006.sql and we uploaded it, or imported, I should say, into phpMyAdmin and we created a whole whack of brand new users. Now we're not done with phpMyAdmin, we're gonna be going in there in and out periodically. Um, the only reason we didn't create the user table in there is because we require so many fields, it would just take forever. Uh, it was much easier to just upload an already created SQL file. Plus, at the end of the day, you're already learning how to create SQL tables anyway, right? So there's really no point in relearning it in this class. But I think for our first resource, I'll show you how to do it in our phpMyAdmin, just so you get the experience of using the GUI. That's it. All right. So make sure you have your includes directory, your users directory, and your comp1006 directory. Last week, we created a index file under our users, and we populated it with a whole bunch of our user information, right? Now, in order for me to see this running, what application do I need to start? Because I can't see this in my browser until I start a certain application. What application do I need to run in order to see this in, that's right, WAMP. We need to run WAMP. So go down to Cortana, type in WAMP, Hit enter, choose yes, and you'll see it open up in your taskbar. Right now it's red, should start to shift and go green, and there it goes. Once it goes green, you can go ahead and open up Chrome or Edge or Safari or whatever it is you're using, or God help you, Internet Explorer. And just to make sure everything is working properly, go ahead to localhost. Hit enter. If WAMP is functioning correctly, you should see this page, right? I want to navigate to our Comp1006 directory, so I'm going to hit slash after localhost, type in Comp1006, and now I can see a list of all the directories I have available in there, and I'm going to go to my lesson three directory. I'm going to go to lesson three Wednesday, but you guys are going to go to lesson three. <laughs> I 
So in here we have our includes and our users directories in here. Let's just make sure our project is still working from last week. So we'll click on users and that will immediately open up a list of our users unless we have an error, which I have an error right now. And the reason why I have an error is because I don't have this comp 1006 Wednesday, um, but I can fix that. Give me one second to fix that so that mine looks like yours. Because now I can get away with just the same directory. Nope, that's not it. Control R. There we go. There's all our users. Not very pretty, eh? It's all kind of clustered together. It's kind of ugly looking. We're going to implement uh, Bootstrap today, make this look a little nicer. But before we do that, we're going to actually work with the PHP includes library in order to actually take out chunks of our HTML that we're going to use over and over and over again and put them in their own kind of file. And then we'll just include that wherever we need it. Now you can, you probably remember in your HTML classes when you created your HTML pages, you had to have the doc type, your opening and closing HTML tags, your opening and closing body tags, your titles, all that type of information. When you started putting in your style sheets, you had to make sure your style sheet was included at the top, any JavaScript was included below. And what you probably found as programmers, it was kind of redundant because every page in that web app that you built use the same HTML. And you were just basically copying it and pasting it into the next file exactly as it was, and then typing new content in it. Well, that's the whole power of dynamic PHP and the web, right? The whole power of dynamic server-side languages is that we don't have to type that crap over and over again. We type it one time, one time, we save it in its own file, and then when we wanna use that particular head that contains our CSS file, contains some content that we need, we simply just include it into whatever file we want to work with. Now, obviously, this works better in demonstration than it does in explanation. The good news is, is we've already built a part of this as was. So what we'll do is we'll extract it and we'll move it into its own stuff. Yesterday, I walked through the students actually doing it from scratch. So if you do want to see this process from the ground up, you're feel free to re review that video from yesterday. I did post it to you guys as well. <clears throat> but for now, go ahead, under users, open up your index.php file. So right now we have this chunk of PHP at the top that allows us to do a connection, right? And then we have our HTML below. Most IDs, IDEs have something called cold fold, or code folding, which allows you to basically collapse blocks of code so that you don't have to see them. And the way you do that is, if you notice as I bring my cursor up, I can see a little symbol over here in the actual lines bar. Now, if your IDE doesn't support that, sorry, your IDE doesn't support that. Most do. But the cool thing about it is, I don't want to see this code right now because it's in my way. I can actually use that to collapse it. And then I can move on. The way it works is it will collapse nested blocks. That's how it works. So it'll just collapse whatever's in a current block. It's not gone. It doesn't disappear. You haven't deleted it. All you've done is collapse it. You can uncollapse it by pressing the button. This is just visual. It's just the IDE doing for this for you. It does nothing to the code itself. Like the code itself, if you open this file and something else, you'll see it's fully just the way it was. So the reason why I'm doing that, though, is so that I can easily show you my page without having to deal with a bunch of other blocks. We're going to copy from here to the body tag. So go ahead and highlight those, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines all together. Highlight them. Either right click and choose copy or hit control C on your keyboard. If you have a Mac, it's command C. And then we're gonna create a new file in our includes directory. So right click on the includes directory and choose new file. And I learned something very interesting. Header appears to be a keyword in Apache, and Apache won't let us see any files that begin with header. They disappear, which is super weird. Don't know why that is, but there's a way around it. We can actually start our file with an underscore. Type header.php. The good news is, is this is a common practice anyways for any file that you're using as an include file. So that when somebody's looking through your directory, they can quickly see that that file is just an included file. It's a partial 
it's not a complete file on its own. Go ahead and paste the code we copied into there inside the header.php file. And we're gonna make a couple of modifications. Because I wanna use this at the top of every HTML page I create, I need to make sure it's dynamic and that I can modify the data inside of it. If you look right now, I have a hard coded piece of data that's not going to work for me. I don't want my title of every single page I have to be users. That doesn't make sense, right? I want to be able to change that dynamically. So what I can do is I can actually use variables to be able to do that, right? That's what we use variables for so that we can modify data, store information, and then use it at a different place. The problem that exists though is how do I get the data actually in here once I define a variable? Well, the good news is PHP uses four different ways to include a file. They have include, they have include once, they have require, and they have require once. All four basically do the same thing with some slight differences between each one. But the big thing is that they do, they copy the contents in that file and literally paste them in place wherever you call it. So when we created our connect.php file and we included that, that's all that was happening. It was literally copying the content and pasting it directly into the file. That's why we were able to access the con variable because the con variable was technically in the file we were in. So we want to be able to use that kind of, I don't know, uniqueness with PHP to our advantage in order to set this variable we're going to call it title. So let's do, let's do an inline shorthand echo statement like we learned in week one and two. <clears throat> so that's a shorthand echo statement, which is literally just going to echo whatever we type in there out to the screen, right? So we want to basically say, if the title has been defined, if there's a variable called title, then put that out to the screen. Otherwise, put out a default thing, right? And there's a couple of ways we can do that. There's actually quite a few. We could do it the really super long way. I'll show you the super long way. I'm gonna split these up. We're gonna change this to PHP. And we're gonna go if is set. So is set is a PHP function that basically will tell you if a variable is exists or not. And it doesn't even have to like be instantiated, just exist. If it doesn't exist, it'll just return false. Dollar sign underscore title. We're gonna call it dollar sign underscore title so we don't have any conflicts. So if title is set, let's give it a block. Then we're going to echo dollar underscore title. Otherwise, I'm going to echo out a default thing. So I'll just call it for now my default title. <clears throat> so how many lines is that? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, including the tag. Not to mention dealing with the fact that we're now on new line characters because we're trying to nest this within the title block, right? So that's kind of frustrating. This is big for no reason. It's just a big block of stuff for no reason. So we can actually make this a little bit smaller, right? How many of you have heard of ternary before or used a ternary before? Just a couple of you. So what a ternary is, is it's essentially like this, but it's written in one line statement. And it's basically just an inline if else, essentially is what it is. And the way it looks, we'll write it on another line just so you can kind of see the difference between the two. The way it looks, uh, we'll write this in longhand still. Just because I feel like it'll be a little easier to understand. The ternary has three pieces to its operator. It has a question mark, it has a colon, and then it is terminated with the semicolon, okay? The thing before the question mark is what condition you want to check. What is it you're trying to evaluate? Well, the condition I want to check is, is title set? 
So that's what that's doing. I'm saying, is this title set? And I'm using the is that function to tell me that. Is this title set? And that's where the question mark comes in. Has this been set? If yes, I write my true statement here. And if no, I write my false statement here. So that's the general structure of a ternary. Your condition, a question mark to ask to evaluate the condition, whether what should execute if it was true and what should execute if it was false. So now let's just move some of our stuff down. So if it was true, I want to spit back title. Otherwise, I want to spit back my default title. And then I need to make sure I write echo before this whole line. And that's called a ternary. That is available in C. It's available in Java. So you guys could use that with your Java code as well. Uh, Ruby, JavaScript, so many different languages. I have touched one language that didn't have it in it. Oh, CoffeeScript, but don't worry about that. That's a weird version of JavaScript. <clears throat> All right, one more way, probably the way that I would choose, just because as I've stated before, I'm super lazy. So I like to do things in nice shorthand. So I'm gonna use the shorthand echo statement. I mean, why write echo if I don't need to? So my shorthand echo statement. And looking at this, really all I need to know is, does this variable exist? Because if it doesn't, then I want you to do this. That's literally all I wanna say. I shouldn't have to evaluate it with some third party function. That's really stupid. Especially considering most languages, let you do things like this. They let you do this, which is using the logical operator or, and what will happen is if this doesn't evaluate, it's not true, it's undefined, it's false, it won't take this side, it will go to this side, oh yeah, that's true, and it will return it when it's done. So every other language has this operator in it and you can use it. Like you can do it in Java, you can do it in JavaScript. Most people don't know about that. Um, PHP as of seven implemented a new operator to do the same kind of operation. You can type dollar sign underscore title or my default title but the problem is, is that PHP, unlike JavaScript, C++, Java, and Ruby, so many other web languages, it treats this differently. It says, oh, this is a Boolean evaluation, so I will return the Boolean value. So instead of returning back my default title, it simply returns true, which is useless. <laughs> so Instead of just, you know, in 7.1 of PHP, instead of just making that work the way it should work, the way it works functionally in every other language, PHP is like, no, no, no. We're going to give you a new operator to do this. And that is the double question mark. And what the double question mark, their theory behind this is first question mark basically says, hey, do I exist? Am I a thing? Cool. Otherwise, it says, does this thing exist? Is this a thing? Cool. So if this one fails, it'll return this one. If this one has a value, then this one will get returned. Does that make sense? So really, when you look at it, this tiny little line here is the equivalent to this whole statement. They're the exact same thing. They functionally do not work differently. They work exactly the same way. So, I know students like to keep things around. What I would recommend is just highlight all these lines, create yourself a little help doc somewhere and just dump those lines into your help doc and just keep them around. Just so you can see what that syntax structure looks like. For the purpose of our actual header file, we're just going to use the very nice inline small tiny statement and we're going to remove these other lines because we don't need them 
And we might as well just put it on the same line because it doesn't take up that much room. And there we go. Now, the good news is, is even though we have PHP in here and even though title is not defined, if we were to open this file inside our browsers, it will not blow up. It'll still just work the way it should. <coughs> So a couple more things we need to do. I want to implement uh, Bootstrap into our projects and also Font Awesome and give us the ability to use Font Awesome and Bootstrap. In order to do that, we're going to need to download Bootstrap and Font Awesome. Now, the yesterday's class, we did it by downloading the actual library. With you guys, I think we'll just use a CDN. We'll just go get the content delivery network piece of it and we'll bring it back. So I'll show you how that's done. If you open up your browser, is anybody still typing this, just out of curiosity? Yeah, okay, I'll give you a second. All right, there we go. The rest of you, go ahead and open up your browser. And you're going to go type in uh, Google Bootstrap space CDN. So it's going to look like this, Bootstrap CDN. And it's this quick start one, Bootstrap CDN by StackPath or bootstrapcdn.com. The thing I love about this CDN website, when you scroll down, see these little arrows here? You can actually click on them and they give you what it looks like in the different various languages you might be using. So it already creates the link for you, the actual syntax for the HTML link, which is kind of handy. So we need the CSS, so I'm just going to click on the one that says HTML, and that will copy it to the clipboard automatically for us. Once it's copied to the clipboard, we're going to go and paste that in the head of the header file. So once again, go to bootstrapcdn.com, navigate down to where it says complete CSS, and click the little arrow so this fly window pops out and then click on HTML to copy that. Second you click on it, it will say copy text to clipboard. <clears throat> so now that I have it copied, I'm gonna go over to my visual editor. I'm gonna come up here into the head and I'm gonna put it above my title just because that's my preference. I'm just gonna paste it right in place and I'm gonna hit save. Now, if you're sitting there typing this out, please, Go to Google, type Bootstrap CDN, go to that website, get Bootstrap CDN, and copy the CSS code. Don't be typing that out. It takes forever. <clears throat> All right. Gentlemen, can you please either use like Slack Messenger or something like that to talk? because all I can hear is you talking in my ear. Thanks. Next piece we need is this complete JavaScript bundle at the bottom. Just open the fly window, not that fly window, this fly window here. Click on it, copies it over to your clipboard, and then we're going to paste that as well. But we're going to paste that in a different place. <clears throat> so once again, just click the bottom arrow, click on that, and it will copy to your clipboard or highlight it and hit control C. <clears throat> All right, go to your Visual Studio. We now need to create our second file. We're going to create a new file under the includes called underscore footer.php. So now you have a header file and a footer file, both files, and we're gonna use the footer files where we're gonna put our, the basically from the closing body tag down in that one file we had in users, All right? Does everybody have a footer file? Anybody not have a footer file yet? Cool. Go over to your user's index file, scroll here, just collapse. Use that wonderful cold fo code folding thing and collapse it over. And basically you just want from the body tag to the closing HTML tag. I mean, you really could just type them out. It's not two words. Gonna to go to footer and I'm gonna paste those in place.
So now that thing that we had copied before, we accidentally overrode our clipboard. So we're going to go need to copy that again. I'll give you a second to finish up there. <clears throat> Sorry about that. Go back to your quick start bootstrap thing. Copy that same line again, the HTML line for the JavaScript bundle. So you have it. And then in your editor, we're going to put that above this body line right here. <clears throat> so what we've done, we've taken the top part of a normal HTML page and we've moved it into its own file. Then we've taken the bottom part of an HTML page and moved it into its own file. So now for every single dynamic page we create, we just include header, include footer, and then type the unique content in between. So you get common header, common footer, but all your content in the middle is unique, right? So it makes it much easier than having to type out your HTML header and your HTML footer every single time you create a new page like you would in a static HTML site, all right? These other pieces we included, this is the Bootstrap JavaScript, which we don't necessarily need today, but we will need in the future. Uh, and then this piece here in our header file, this is their CSS. Whoops. There we go. Oh, low battery. Probably wouldn't be a great thing to run out of power. <clears throat> any questions about any of that? Is anything that confusing for that stuff, or is it pretty easy? Okay. Taking it at face value. <clears throat> All right, so the next step. We want to take these two files, the header and footer, and we want to change our user's index file to start utilizing them so that we don't have to have all of that HTML in there. We can just make it, um, we can make it dry, which stands for don't repeat yourself. We can make it code reusable across the board. So go ahead and open up your index file in your users. And I mean, we're already at the bottom, so we might as well do the bottom first. Highlight the body in the HTML tag. Hit enter. So it disappears. And type PHP include. And then close your PHP tag. Include takes one argument, and that is the path to the file. So wherever the file exists, that's what it's looking for. The easiest way, the hands down easiest, simplest way to get the path to the file is to move your cursor over here, right click on your footer, and choose to copy your relative path. If you don't have that option, that's fine. You can just like literally type out what I type out because it will be the same. That needs to be in the opposite direction. Like so. Next step, this body tag up to this doc HTML tag. So where we have our actual um, declaration, the doc type down to the opening body tag, we're going to replace that with PHP include, includes underscore header dot PHP. And we're gonna close that tag. So now you have your header file, your content for the user's page, and then your footer file. The header file contains all the information you need to open an HTML page. The footer file contains all the information you need to close an HTML page. The great part about that is when you add your CSS file at a later point, any changes you make to your CSS file will affect every single page in your whole site because they're all using the same header file, right? Go ahead and save that up. Go to your browser, go to your users, and hit refresh. So we're getting a failed to open stream, no such file. So what that means is that the path that we've given it, it doesn't quite understand where that is. Part of the issue we're gonna have is because we're nested into these um, sub files. So that makes it a little trickier. 
So basically we want to look at how we would navigate to that file in the first place. So I'm in here and I want to get to here. So I need to step out of this directory, step into this directory and access the header file. So what step out looks like, it's two dots to step out. Then we have our includes directory, which steps us back in and then our file name. And then you would do the same thing to the footer, two dots to step out and then the slash to step back in again. Paths are probably going to be the most annoying thing we deal with and kind of get away from you a little bit. And then only because it's annoying me, I'm going to move all this stuff by hitting shift tab to the far left of the screen because it makes sense. All right. So if we go back to our browser now and hit refresh, the orange arrows should disappear now that you've added these two dots in this flash. Hit refresh. Not only has it disappeared, notice that Bootstrap has made our page look nice and fancy. Super nice and clean. There's stripes. We've got some nice text. Looks pretty, right? Those reusable header and footer we're going to use on every page we do. Every file we work with, we'll use those. We're also going to create a reusable nav that we'll just include on every single page as well. So we always have the same navigation. All right, one more thing just before we take a break. Everything else should be okay. But you'll notice that our header up here says my default title. And remember, we created that title variable. We can actually trigger that so that we can set this so that it changes. All we have to do is in the file that's including the header file, we define a variable above it, the same variable. We make it equal to a value. Sean's super awesome site, for example. And what will happen because all include is doing is literally copying the contents of the file and dumping it in, which means the variable we defined in that file is now defined in here or trying to be accessed in here. We just gave it a value. It will now be accessible in there and you will now see its value. So which means if you jump over to your browser, so just head over to your browser, hit refresh, and now your tab should say something else. It should say whatever value you put in there. Mine says Sean's super awesome site. Somebody out there probably also says Sean's super awesome site because people tend to just write what I write. You should pay attention to what I write because I like to screw with people and make them write things. <laughs> All right, why don't we take a 10 minute break? We're motoring along pretty good. We'll take a 10 minute break. I'll help anybody who's stuck or has errors. Uh, and then we'll get back to it. Actually, let's get back to it at eight o'clock. Cool? All right. One second and I'll be around. All right. So we've added in our uh, include to include our header. We have our footer. It probably wouldn't hurt for us to have a nav. Um, I mean, it's 8.08. I, would, I think we have time to do a nav. Do we have time? You know what? We'll copy and paste yesterday's nav, <laughs> and then you guys can just see it. There's no PHP in it anyway, so you're not losing much. Uh, let's do the pieces that we do need to do. So under the includes folder, we will create a new file called underscore main-nav.php. So that's main-nav, I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see it, main-nav.php. We're gonna create that file. Now here's how I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna be that guy and I'm gonna make you install Slack <laughs> because I'm gonna paste the code into Slack. That's the deal. So here's how you do it. 
you're going to go over to Blackboard, and I'm going to do it with you because I haven't actually installed it on the Windows side of my computer. So go to Blackboard, sign in. Go to your PHP shell. Click on Resources. Click on Slack Invite. If you've already done this, you don't need to do it again. If you haven't, you want to do this. Now, we don't want this. What we want is we want the download link. So we're going to go to Slack Download because we want to be able to download it for Windows right there. That's what we want. There's a 64-bit version. Download the 64-bit version unless you're rocking Windows XP, which probably still is one of the best Windows operating systems that ever was. That and Windows 2000. Hands down the best one. Very minimal bloat, very minimal resource heavy. Windows 10, I mean, after the last improvement, Windows 10's a little better, but. All right, it's only 75 megs. Okay, cool. So. Click on your Slack setup.exe. This will install Slack as an application on your computer. If you don't want Slack open, you just close it. Yep. You having issues with it installing? Yeah. Oh, in your taskbar up here, you're going to type in Slack download. And then just click the top option there. Not that option. Go back a page. Uh, that thing, yeah. There you go. Now it's going to say sign in. Most of you probably don't have an account. So what you're going to do instead is click get started. Okay, you're going to click get started. Your workspace URL. And the cool thing about Slack is even when you go out into the industry and you start working for other people, you're going to find that most companies use Slack. They're going to give you your workspace URL. You don't need to create a new user account. You just add the workspace URL. You can have tons and tons of workspace URLs. I don't know how well you're going to be able to see this from where you're sitting. Uh, doo -doo -doo. So I have five, five workspace URLs, one email address connected to all five. Pretty easy. So the workspace URL is G C C O M P. S T U D I E S. I'll zoom in a little bit so you can see. So G C comp studies dot slack dot com. <clears throat> Chris Naismith came up with the name Georgian College Computer Studies. I'm sure you could guess that. Once you've done that, go ahead and click continue. And then it's going to ask you to type in a username and a password. I would use your Georgian email. You can use your personal one if you want, that's fine, but use your Georgian email, I would recommend. Um, and I would use a password you're going to remember. Not that it matters, you can always retrieve it if you need to. And fill out whatever other information is there. And then once you're done, you should be able to click on the sign in or sign up or whatever, and it will sign you into Slack. And this is going to pop up. It's going to pop up with this little bar and say open Slack. You want to click yes, because then it will open the app and tie your account to it. Like so. All right. I just want to see where people are at. Do you already have it? Okay. So you're already going through the sign up process. Sign it up. Cool. So yeah, just use your email and your address or your password and then click sign in. Okay, so it's G C C O M P S T U D I E S. So yeah, G C Comp Studies. Go ahead and hit continue. And then type in your Georgian email and just come up with a password. 
<clears throat> so in addition to me being able to post code at you that you guys can then copy and paste, I always post announcements to this as well, which means you'll get them a lot faster. You can communicate with me in within like a two hour period. So it's super fast that way. And as you progress through your college career, you're likely to have Chris Naismith or any one of the other instructors that is sitting on there. So you'll be able to talk to them as well. If you have an instructor that's not on there, encourage them to join <laughs> because they should be using it. <laughs> is it not letting you do it? No, just type in any password. It doesn't matter. It shouldn't matter. I mean, there's like, you have to use one letter, one number kind of thing, but there it goes. Oh, it, I think you already have an email address associated with it. It seems to think you do. So try forgot password and type in your email. And then hit get reset link. Cool, go check that email for the reset link. Did you get the same thing? Yeah, and then, but I've never signed up for this. So then it says, uh, turns out email address doesn't have an account. Workspace. Just click on the sign up then if there's a sign up option. Hmm. Does it give you a sign up option? Like you have one. Okay. Join. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, same with you. Just click the join. Where's your email that you got? Did you get an email with the reset link? Yeah. <coughs> it's fine. He had the same issue. Um, just click on the password reset. No, it turns out the email doesn't have an account. Scroll down, scroll down, scroll down. Um, if you have any other questions. See, he had a cool little join link. Where's your join link? Uh, all right, let's do this the old-fashioned way. Click a new thing. Type in Slack. It's not those letters. <laughs> nope, it's not that either. It's S-L-A-C-K. There you go. Uh, nope, that one. And uh, type in your email address, the one that you want to use. Hit try for free. Cool. Find your Slack workspace. Go to your, sorry, no, go back one link. Hit try for free again. Sorry. We actually need to do the other option. No. Yeah, no, it is find your workspace. Click on that. We'll do it the other way. Go to your email address, like to your email. Uh, you should have a new email. Um, oh, you're not using your Georgian email. Use your Georgian email. Yeah, you have to use your Georgian email. I think what the issue might be is if you're not using your Georgian email, I think Chris may have set it up that you can't join this channel without your Georgian email. I'm using my normal email. Yours is working? I don't know what's wrong with his then. Not for him. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> .on.mca? Yeah. Now check your email. Okay, I'm not sure what's happening here. Can somebody give him a hand that's set up there? Do you mind helping him actually with his? This gentleman's gonna help you with you. <clears throat> all right, just while other people are still setting up, you'll notice there's channels. You may not have all the channels that I have. So if you want them, you see this little plus sign beside channels, that's for creating. But if you actually click the word channels, It'll list them all in here. Ours is this one, the Comp 1006 F19 channel. That's the one you want to join. You want that one. You want general. 
random, maybe computer studies, but make sure you at least have the Comp 1006 one because that's the most important one. So all you have to do is just click on it and you'll be automatically in it. Aggressive. <laughs> What's that? And it was like a four digit password, and then I got the same name. Let's go there. Mm -hmm. You're saying that this is not. This email is not there anymore. All right. Let's uh, let's just try to find the workspace. Not use the full email for it. Um, I don't know why it does it this way. This is so weird. Uh, is this the address you're using? Yeah. Did you get the Slack application, though? No. You didn't download it? No. Do I have to? Yes. That makes this much easier. Yeah, okay. You need to download Slack. Because then you can actually add it right directly in, and then it will tell you to sign up if you're not already signed up. Okay. Um, I think the people wouldn't work for my last one. You have to do 32 always? Yes, because my OS is 32. What? <gasps> Professor is 64, and it's always 32. What horrible person did that to you? Um. They installed the 32-bit version of the operating system. What? Why? No idea. So you actually wind up with performance hits from that, right? Okay? <laughs> um, if I have to buy a new laptop. You don't need to buy a new laptop. You just need them to install the 64-bit version of it. Yeah. Which does mean you probably have to transfer all your stuff to a hard drive just for safety matters and then change yeah. it to And then change it over. You likely have a... Um, what's it called, a restore partition on your hard drive where Windows will actually be on that partition and you can actually trigger the whole restore process and it will reinstall a whole brand new version of Windows in 64-bit mode. It's already a part of it. And your key will likely be underneath your laptop. Really? Yeah, usually. The product key. Yeah, the product key is usually on the bottom. Well, somewhere. <laughs> or they should have given you a card for it. Because the 32-bit version, you'll take a performance hit. It actually causes one thing, for example, 32 bits can only support so much of a hard drive. So you wind up with a reduced hard drive size, too. So say you had like a terabyte. You can't actually access the whole terabyte. You can only access half of it. Stuff like that. Just because it's in 32-bit. So I can do that change the OS from 32 Oh, yeah. No, but your processor's it's guaranteed it's already 64. Yeah. Because it has to be, right? Oh, I think I know why this is not working. Yeah. We need to fix this one. This is the invite link. Go ahead and type your email address. Okay. I think glides a little too much. <laughs> 64 if you have a 64-bit operating system, then yeah. Click verify email. Cool, go check your email. And then this will complete the, yeah, confirm. From you know? So you didn't do the, oh, okay, yeah. Thank you so much. It's taking a minute.
go ahead and fill that out. No worries. And then help your friend. <laughs> All right. So even if you're behind and you haven't actually completed the registration process, don't worry. I'm going to post the code now for you. <clears throat> We do have a limit because we're using a free version of Slack. We haven't actually paid for the registered version. We've, we're still in conversations with the college to actually pay for it. Um, once they pay for it, then we can actually put up more files and we can have more users and all this other stuff. So I'm gonna copy this. This is the users index page. I'm gonna go to the comp channel in Slack. I'm gonna, hi, Avtar. Who's Avatar? <laughs> That's funny. All right, I'm gonna post this in here. Users index. And there we go. So all you have to do is just click on it. It's kind of like covered. When you click on it, it will expand. Either you can copy or you can download and open. It's totally up to you. But that's this page that we just worked on. Cool. So the other benefit to Slack is if um, you're having an issue with your code, you can always jump into Slack and type, you know, my question, like, this is my problem, can anybody help? And even if I'm not available, other instructors who have taught PHP might be able to reach out and help you, or even other classmates who maybe understand it might be able to reach out and help you as well. So it's definitely a community idea, right? It makes it everybody kind of able to communicate and talk about this particular class or any one of your classes that you have. <clears throat> Incidentally, I've taught many classes at Georgian and while I haven't done Java, I do know a little bit, but I can help you with your other courses as well. If you ever have an issue in SQL or something like that and you need a question answered, you can feel free to also chat to me on Slack and I will help you with it. All right, cool. So that should be that file. The main nav, that's the one we wanna work with. I'm gonna copy the contents that I did yesterday with my students yesterday, and I'm just gonna put it in. It's just HTML, that's all it is. Um, it just makes a nice little navigation bar at the top of the screen, looks nice and pretty, very simple. Uh, but then we don't need a whole bunch of other stuff. So let me do that first. I will open it up and then do that for you. So comp 1006, uh, no, actually maybe, you know what, I'll give you the newer one. The newer one is much prettier. The one that's coming for next week. So that's going to go in your includes directory. I have a boring ringtone too. <laughs> I have the same one that came with my phone. <laughs> All right. So now you'll have this main nav code that you can go copy and paste. And you're going to paste that code into your main nav.php file that we created under your lesson three Wednesday. And then I'll talk about it once you guys have got that in. So once again, you're going to include, you've created an underscore main dash nav.php file, right? Has anybody not created that file? So under includes, you're creating an underscore main dash nav.php file. Then you're gonna to go to Slack. And the last message I posted in here, if you open it, cause it will be collapsed. If you open it, you can go ahead and copy the code in there, just like that. You'll notice it doesn't copy the line numbers. It just copies the code. Hit control C, right? Or right click and choose to copy. Jump over here and then paste it in the file.
So one thing you may want to change right off the bat, you'll notice that there's an anchor link here and it currently says SM. Those are my initials. My initials are SM. You may want to change it to your initials just so it's personal to you because you are building your own personal portfolio. So it makes sense for it to be personal to you. So that's on line two. So on line two, change those initials to your initials. Currently they say SM. You want to change them to whatever your name is. So NAV, right? You guys should recognize that from your HTML class, right? It's an HTML5 semantic tag, which means that this thing is navigation. That's what it stands for. The class, all these little class things that you see up here, they're coming from this really easy to use um, CSS framework <clears throat> called Bootstrap. How many of you are familiar or heard of Bootstrap? Okay, that's surprising. I figured more people would know it. Um, it's made by a company that you might also know called Twitter. <laughs> and uh, Twitter ba built Bootstrap basically to solve a problem. They had designers and they had developers and the designers were getting pissed off because the developers, when they would be sent the code to actually, sorry, when they'd be sent the designs, they weren't always exactly what the designers wanted. There was issues with the way they were designing. And it would be things like the distance between the top of the page and the first title, things like that, really goofy little things. And so they said, okay, well, we're gonna come up with a whole code guide for you that basically tells you what you need to do. And the developers thought, you could do that, or <laughs> we could create a CSS framework. We just drop in the framework and you literally just tell us what class to apply to each thing, or eventually get to the point where they were able to do HTML and CSS themselves and just do it themselves. But the end result was basically developers who have no design capabilities whatsoever being able to put out prototypes that actually had decent quality look to them. And Bootstrap's usually pretty recognizable. Most people, and you will develop that skill too, to be able to actually just tell when something is Bootstrap. Uh, it's usually the layout is the first trigger. And then rounded edges, that very distinct Bootstrap blue, um, things like that, they basically automatically trigger the idea that this thing is Bootstrap. So all these classes you see here, navbar, navbar expand, navbar dark, bg dark, all those classes, they're all bootstrap classes that not only provide a style to your page, but will also, start, will also add some functionality to the page as well. So once you've pasted that and you've saved it, we need to include the main nav into our header file because we wanna make sure the nav comes across every single page. So we'll just put it directly in the header file. <clears throat> so, just under body, because we want the nav to be right at the top of our page from side to side. So, just under body, under the header.php, we're going to write a PHP include statement. And we're going to add the path, which should be, if I'm right, dot slash underscore main dash nav dot PHP. I'm pretty sure that's the path. So that's under your header.php file. So. They really need a projector right there. <laughs> like the class is way too big for one projector. Doesn't make sense. <clears throat> So that's include, right? And the path is dot forward slash underscore main dash nav dot PHP. So if that worked, you should be able to go to your browser. Make sure you're on your page here, right? I'm just gonna zoom out a little bit because I'm really far in and hit control R to refresh. And it looks like I have an error, no such stream on line 10. Now, the reason this likely is, is because we kind of have this situation, which is kind of annoying, but it's how it works. So we have a directory called includes, right? And then in there, we have the underscore uh, header file. And then we also have our main nav file, right? And I want main nav to be included in header. 
preferably. So usually because we're in the same directory, if I want it included, I should only have to do dot slash main nav. The reason why it doesn't work is because we have users and we have our index page, right? Our index page is currently loading header into itself. So when it's trying to access main nav now, it's expecting to come out of this directory into this directory and into here. So instead of it being written this way, it wants it with the two dots because it's actually coming up the directory. We're going to look at how to normalize our paths next week because this gets really frustrating after a while. So you want two dots, slash includes likely, to make that work. Somebody sending me a message? Hi. <laughs> so it's two dots, includes, underscore main nav dot PHP, and hopefully that should fix the problem. Let me just double check to make sure it did. And it does. And that's the reason why. <clears throat> so what most developers will do is they'll create a directory variable that allows them to start at the root of their application. And then they can use that directory variable and append to it. So they use something called absolute paths. And what an absolute path means is it always starts at the root of your application. What we're trying to use is called relative paths, which means start where I am and then just work your way around, which causes a lot of confusion when you start including, because now it's not from that location, it's from a different location. And we're gonna have issues with this as well, because if we were to put an index page on the main and then include that header file, it's going to break because we're not in the correct directory. So that's gonna be an issue. Anyways, long story short, if you look at your Thing. You should now have this wonderful black bar. You should see your initials. You should see home, my profile, users, login, register, and log out. Basically, all the links we're going to deal with over the next couple of weeks. <clears throat> okay, now we're going to type some PHP finally. <laughs> so last week, we did our index file for users. And as I was saying before, index I like to keep index representing all of the data that you have in your database. And I call that an index file. So it's not all the data in your database, sorry, all the data that belongs to this resource. So if I want only one resource piece, I'll create a new file, a new view. That's what I call it. This is a view. I'm going to create a different view that's going to allow us to see only one person. And I'm going to need a way to get there. So what I'll do is just add a link onto each one of these people so that I can easily get to the view and actually see what is under the, what's underneath that person. So we're going to build that today. Super easy. Sounds more complex than it is, but it's super easy. Let me just find my view file. All right. Let's first just create the view itself and then we'll link it up. Cool? So I'm gonna open up my sidebar here. And under users, you should already have a show.php file. Go ahead and open that file. Now we should likely, under the show.php file, we should likely get rid of the things we don't need anymore. So this whole HTML block from line 17 to 11, let's replace that with our PHP includes, right? Because we already have it, so we might as well use it. So include dot dot slash includes slash underscore header dot PHP. We're replacing from body to the doc type. That's what you're replacing. Body to the doc type.
I'm just going to cold code fold this div. And I'm going to take from body and HTML here. And I'm going to replace that with the PHP include dot dot slash includes slash underscore footer dot PHP, just like we did in the index file. So think about it. how long did it take us to set up that header file? Like a half hour, almost an hour to build the header file and the footer file. Imagine if we had to do that for every page, right? It'd be tedious. Now we don't have to do that. We literally just write these two lines and immediately have everything we need. In the next half of the term, I'm going to show you an even cooler trick where we use function calls to load our data in and we never modify this page. We have one page and every piece of the data just goes directly into it. All right. So we have that in there. Let's go make sure it's working. So jump over to your browser. And after users, type show.php, and you should see this. Name, email, phone, and all absolutely empty. Please don't be offended, but I'm just going to silence notifications for a little bit. So I'm happy. Hi, everybody. It's saying hi. which would be helpful if there was an easy place to silence them. The heck do you do it in Windows? <laughs> Never mind. I'm going to close it for now. <laughs> I'll deal with it later. Okay. You're not going to see a user here yet because we actually need to be able to set that up. And we need a way to be able to tell it what user we actually want to access. So we're going to do all that right now. So the first bit we're going to do, come up here to the top. We have a comment that says start session, assign the session variables, clear the session variables so it's blank the next time and get the users. Those first three comments, we're not going to do quite yet. We'll do that when we start with sessions. We're going to do this one, get the users. Well, first of all, we have a spelling mistake. It's not users, it's user. We're going to get the user, just one guy. Just one dude in the database. Maybe you do that. Who knows? <clears throat> the next step is for us to include our connection script because our connection script is what allows us to connect to MySQL. Remember I said we're ever only going to write it once? That's totally true. And here's the time where we get to just include the silly thing. Includes connect.php. Semicolon. Yay, we have our connection script. Now, I usually have, I don't know if it's a bad habit or a good habit. I have a habit that once I do something like that, where I include my connection script, I save my page, I go to my browser, I refresh just to make sure I don't have any errors. Because that's the first huge chunk of connection or like con, um, script that could cause things to blow up. I've got no errors. I'm happy. <clears throat> Let's write the next few lines that we need. So the next line we need is the SQL statement we're going to execute. So when we did our index run, we actually wrote a SQL state statement that said select star from users, right? Which means select all columns from the users table and no condition. It was just literally that statement. So it looks like I need to go away slack. There. It looks like this. We're going to create a variable and we're going to make it equal to a string. And then we're going to type our select statement right directly in there. Let's see how well you've been doing in your MySQL class. Help me out. What is the command for me to select all the columns from the users table? Exactly, select star from users. What if I only want a user that has the ID of say one? 
where, yep, where, ID, perfect. So it looks like this. It's select star from users, which is our database table name, and then our clause, where ID is equal to one. <clears throat> now, you're probably like, wait a minute. That means I will only ever get user one. I've literally created a page for just one person that will be permanently immortalized in our application. What if I want to make it so that I can have any user and not just this one user? I want to be able to have any one of the users in our database and be able to display them within our template. Well, that means we need to be able to make this dynamic. We need to be able to make it that we can choose any user based on the information that we get back, but we need to be secure about it. So one way we can do this is using something called query parameters, which we saw when I talked about requests and posts a while back. Query parameters are basically, you know when you go to Amazon or Google and you see all of those characters that come off the end of google.com and it's like a question mark and a whole whack of other stuff. All of that stuff is query parameters. It's a key. So the question mark says, this is a query parameter. The next value that comes directly after that is the key. Then you'll see a little equal sign and then the value. So it's always key and value, key and value. So what we can do is we can type on the end of show, which I can show you right now in your browser, type a question mark at the end of show, type ID, equals, and let's type five, just so it's a different number than the one we're trying to access, and hit enter. First thing you'll know, the browser does nothing. Didn't change in any way, doesn't modify anything, it doesn't care. Because anything after the question mark, I like the question mark symbol, tells the browser that all this other stuff is a query string. And the browser's like, cool, I don't care. As long as show.php exists, I'm happy. However, what I will do for you, I will take everything after your question mark and I will put it into your request packet and send it off to the server for you. And you can actually see that if you open, no, nope, F12, you'll see that you have this network tab. If you click on the network tab, this will actually show you all traffic exiting and coming in to your site. Click on the preserve log and then just hit refresh. And at the very top, you'll see the two bootstrap files we're accessing, our favicon, all that type of stuff. The one we care about is this show PHP. If you click on it, you can see a preview of what we've got. There's the response we got back from the server, but the one we want is the headers. What the headers will show us is basically all the information about what we're doing. Our request method, which is get, which should be, because most of the default methods we will use is get. The status code back from the server, yay, it's success. Remote address, this always looks like this when you're running local. You'll, you'll actually see an IP address when you're not. Bunch of other information that I don't really care about. The thing I actually care about is at the very bottom here. Actually, can I collapse this? Cool. See this thing that says query string parameters? Do you notice that we have ID and five? That's coming from our address bar. So say I wanna add another value up there. I can write an ampersand to say this is another key. And I can say name equals Sean. If I wanna put a space, I can. However, the browser will correct the space to a 20%. See, it fills it in with a, a filler. Now, if I go to that same one, so this one here, scroll down, you can see now we have ID five and name Sean McKinnon. So why do we use this? So that we can pass dynamic data from one page to another through our browser and to our server. And then our server can use that information in order to do lookups based on that dynamic data. 
So go ahead and get rid of name. We don't really care about that. We're not going to keep that. But keep ID 5. We'll keep ID equals 5. Go back into here. So we need a way to be able to tell MySQL that we don't want to landlock this 1. We don't want a 1 in there. We could put a variable in there, but that is also an issue. If I just jam a variable in here and say, okay, you know what? I'm going to give you ID as a variable. I'm just going to take whatever the user gives me and plug it right into my SQL statement. Does anybody know what that leaves me open to? It's a very common hack. It's called SQL injection. What it means is that somebody can now pass me a semicolon, terminating this statement, and then immediately run a command to pull my whole database down. And now they have my whole database. All because I wasn't smart and I didn't protect the data that I was shoving into my SQL statement. Need to be very careful about that. The good news is that PHP already knows this is a common issue. So PHP gives us something called binding parameters, which allows us to be able to basically fill it in with a placeholder. And then we can go back later and fill the placeholder in with data that will be treated as a literal data piece. So it'll be either a literal string or a literal number. And it can't be modified into a SQL statement. It can't be added as a SQL statement. It won't let you terminate the statement. Even if they gave us SQL data, it gets parsed, escaped, and ripped apart that when it actually gets pushed in, it's not going to mean anything. It has no meaning at the end of the day. So the way we do that, our placeholder, almost like a variable, looks very similar to a variable. It's colon ID. The colon ID is your placeholder. It's your param. This is your parameter that you're going to eventually fill with some sort of data. <clears throat> In order for us to use this this way and use this parameter, we need to tell PHP to actually prepare this statement. What the preparation step actually does is it makes a contract with MySQL. It says to MySQL, I'm going to execute this statement. I'm going to select all your users if this condition is applicable. What will happen next is MySQL will actually build out that statement and store it. And then it will return back a request for any of the parameters that were attached to it. It will say, hey, you told me you're gonna give you some parameters. Let's have them. So we're gonna send them over to it. First, we're gonna prepare the statement. So we're gonna create a new variable and we're gonna call it statement. And we're gonna make it equal to our connection string that we're getting from our includes. That wonderful skinny arrow. And we're gonna call prepare and we pass it our SQL statement. And the good news is, is that almost every single MySQL interaction we do in PHP will follow this same format. You can, if you so choose, you can take this string and directly insert it into there. That is totally valid code. However, I like to keep them separate. It just makes it a little bit more readable. boo -ba doop boo all right, now I'm ready to actually bind my parameter. Yes. That is, that's actually a very good question. I don't know. I, I just always assumed it was PHP, but like way back when I was first learning PHP, that's what I assumed. Now that I know more about programming, I question that that's actual SQL syntax. Um, I will get back to you about that, actually. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, okay, so in the statement piece, we're actually going to bind our parameter, which is going to take our value and plug it in to this SQL code, but in a nice, safe, and friendly way, so that there's no way they can just jam SQL injection code in there. They can't terminate, export our database. We're not going to become the next target, right? You guys remember that story? The Target story, you know who Target is, right? You don't know who Target is? So they're like a big company like Walmart in the States, and they were storing uh, passwords as raw text in their database with no encryption. 
just raw passwords. So say your password was Davy Loves Candy. It was in the database, it was Davy Loves Candy. <laughs> and so somebody performed a SQL injection and yanked the whole database down. Access to people's credit cards, access to their passwords, access to the usernames, all because of not being smart <laughs> with your data. Pretty funny, not for them, funny for us. All right, our next, bet, our next step is to actually bind the parameter. So we're gonna do statement, our skinny arrow. We're gonna call the bind param method. And this takes two arguments, no, three, sorry, three arguments all together. The first argument is the name of the parameter you want to bind to. So that is colon ID. That's the first piece. I want to bind to this thing. That's what I'm giving it. I'm giving it that name. The next piece is the value that I want to give it. So I want to give it five or one or whatever. I want to give it whatever is inside my header. So the way I access that value, that ID value that we put up inside our header, like inside our address bar, is by using the request method array. I think that's what it's called. It's kind of goofy looking. Looks like this. Dollar sign, underscore, and whatever HTTP method you used in order to make your query. We used get, so G-E-T. <laughs> and then that is a hash. And then the ID, does anybody want to guess what the key is that I need to put in here? It's the name that we used in the address bar. When I run this, what will its value be? Does anybody remember? Five, exactly. Where is that coming from? Exactly, the URL. When you go up to the URL, this key is what's going to wind up getting passed into this and then the value it's equal to will be available to us. We have a third argument, and this is where the protection comes in. This is where our nice heavy duty protection is going to come in for us. We can actually data type the value. We can say we will only accept values that are this data type. So we can say PDO, colon, colon, param, int. And that says it's only data types that are an integer. We will only accept integer. So while PHP is a fairly loose language, we don't actually usually have data types. We don't data type our variables. We don't data type our functions, right? We can still use handy helpers to force data typing, at least force the validation of data typing. So just to take it nice and slow, what is happening? We're writing our SQL statement, which is really just a string. That's all it is. Just a string, there's no magic in that string. This piece here takes our connection that we created in our connect script, the connect.php script. That's where that's coming from. And we prepare our SQL statement, which creates a transaction between us and MySQL and says, this is the statement we're going to execute. Get ready, we're gonna send you some parameters. Our next statement is the parameters we're going to send. And you would do this statement for every parameter you put in your MySQL statement. So each one will get its own statement. The first one we're doing is ID because we only have one. So we bind it to this. This value and this value, they're connected. That's where those two are coming from. So these two are together. This is our um, get global variable. It's completely global, it's accessible, and any PHP file you access, you will always have access to get. You'll also have access to post, and you'll have access to session. So there's a few of them like that. Get is going to store all of our query parameters that come from our URL. We have one in there right now called ID. We access it by using the key that was put inside the URL. We use the key ID. If we had to use the key Bob Loves Candy, then this key would be Bob Loves Candy, it's ID. And then the last piece, this is optional, you don't have to do it, but it adds a little bit of extra security. It says this value that's here has to be an integer, must be an integer. 
And there's other ones too. There's also bool, string, pram, or um, bool, string, integer, float, decimal, double. There's a whole bunch of them. So you can actually force those data typings to be what you validate against. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we still haven't finished our execution. The bind param step happens on our side. The prepare step happens between us and MySQL. We've actually created a communication with MySQL. The bind param, nothing has occurred yet until we actually call the next step. The next step is to actually execute our statement. So we say STMT, execute. And what that does is it sends off the bind parameters to MySQL and says you are now ready to build the SQL query and execute it and then be happy with yourself. <laughs> the interesting thing is this is not going to return anything. Nothing comes back from that statement. You're not going to get your records back like you do when you execute MySQL now. When you guys are in your workbench and you type out your SQL statement, you get an immediate response when you execute it. These four lines are not going to give you a response yet. We actually have to use the MySQL, or sorry, the PDO library to get the data we want. And it works out actually a little bit nicer because it's a little bit more human readable. <clears throat> we need to tell it, I want one record, right? Which is only gonna turn run record anyways, right? But I'm saying I want one record, but I don't want it as an array. I just want the single row, that's it. I don't want an array of rows if I'm only getting one record back. Because if I do that, what will happen is our one user will be nested in an array, which makes it very difficult when you only want to access its details because now you got to go nest into the array. So we're going to use a statement called fetch and we're going to store the results into user. Give me arrow, fetch. And that's going to retrieve it and store it into our user variable. So there's a bunch of these different ones. Do you remember the one we used when we did the index? What was the fetch command that we used when we did index? Fetch all. Fetch all will return an array of all of the rows that are inside your, your um, collection. This will return only one row. It will be still a nested array, but the nestings will be those columns that are inside your uh, rows. <clears throat> all right, cool. Let's write some comments so that we don't forget what these things are. So this piece here is our SQL string. This piece here is our um, transaction. To my SQL. This is our binding and validation. This will execute our SQL query. This will fetch a single record or row. I'll even write it in comma, row. All right, so that gives us all of those pieces of data. Super cool, that's awesome. We now have the ability to get our user and actually view our user. However, we still require the actual code that's gonna put the user on the page. <clears throat> Quick question for you. Do you wanna have a 10 minute break now? Or do you want to power through for like the next 25 minutes and leave at 9.30? Who wants to leave at 9.30? Who needs a break desperately? Cool, let's go to 9.30. I like that idea too. Get home early, go to bed. Because <laughs> I'm old. All right. Anybody still typing this stuff out? No? Awesome. I will also copy and paste this file into Slack. So it should make things a little simple. <clears throat> Come down here to where we have our div and our footer. I'm just going to move this back a pace. There we go. And I'm going to unfold my code. Whoop, there it goes. 
sorry. And we have a few things we actually need to fill in here. So we need the user title. So for right now, we'll just call this uh, user. We'll just say user there for now. Let's put it in an H1 though, because it's not actually wrapped in an H1. We'll wrap it in an H1, so it's user. I've done some uh, cheekiness for you. And when I generated the database of users, I also generated a picture for each user. So every user has its own picture. Don't get excited, they're not very great. <laughs> Um, we're going to put the picture in here. <clears throat> it's actually a column in that table. And the way we access it, we're going to write our inline echo statement like so, right? Remember, this is, this basically means the same as PHP space echo, only it's a nice shorthand, right? And then the name of it is uh right okay so it's user which is the name of the field that we did up here so this is where our record is currently stored right stored in the variable user so now we're accessing the variable user and we're going to access the column in the database that has that value in it right which will be in this record and that column's name is avatar Is Avatar funny? <laughs> Are you thinking like the Avatar cartoon? The guy with the big arrow on his head? No? Or maybe that movie, the James Cameron movie with the big walking thing? Oh. All right. <laughs> Whatever is funny is funny. So we can actually see this. At least it will tell us that we got our record back. Plus then you can see the images, right? So if you go over to your browser, and I'm just gonna close this guy off because we don't need it open. And I'm gonna hit refresh. And I'm gonna get a big error. <laughs> oh, because you see I said parm int because I haven't had dinner yet and I'm thinking about chicken parmesan. So I'm gonna go change that from parm int to param int, <laughs> which is what it is. A Little bit more data typing, little less chicken parmesan. All right. Now that should work. If you jump back to your browser and hit refresh, yay, you get your user. And each user has a different one. And if you want to change the user, just change the ID number at the top. Just change it to another number. There's that guy. All the way up to, I think we have 93 records. So you can probably go to 93. That's the last guy. I can do that face. All right. So that's our avatar. Let's, uh, let's fill out the rest of this information. So I want the name and we might as well put the name together as one solid field, right? So we'll do an inline echo statement and we'll say dollar sign username space inline echo statement, dollar sign user. Oh, I did that wrong entirely. Last name. Let me try that again with letters first. There we go. <clears throat> Just so you know, I've, I've seen people do this before where they'll follow along with me and then they'll be like, oh, and they'll hit enter. <laughs> And now this is on the next line and then they'll wind up with a syntax error. The way you know that it is wrapped is you see how it says 33 and then there's a gap here. That means the text is wrapped to the next line. Okay. So just make sure you're aware of that. I don't turn text wrapping off because it makes it even more difficult to see what's going on. So it's all the same line. Don't hit enter. Next, we've got the email. Super easy. Dollar sign user, email.
All right. I'm going to give you a chance to do this. I want you to fill in this phone field. Okay? The name of the column in the database is called phone. <laughs> Go ahead and fill it in. Fill in the phone field. Use what you learned from the two lines above to fill in the phone field. All right. Why don't we use Slack for a minute? That's going to be interesting. Let's see how well this works. All right. Under our channel, the Comp 1006 F19 channel, make sure you're under that channel. I'm going to hide this so it's totally fair. I want you to post in Slack what the code is that you need to display the phone. Go ahead and put it right into Slack. Let me see what it is. I want to see who first answers. Yep. <laughs> then you're not going to be first. <laughs> no. Sorry, Bobby. Uh, yes. Vidi, yes. Andre, yes. Bobby, no. Bobby, change phone to user. There you go. Nice. Cool. You know, minus the clicking in my ear, because it goes did 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 for every single one. Now, oh, now you're doing it on purpose. <laughs> All right. So, these users have it correct. It looks like this equals. Dollar sign user phone like that. Address is going to be a little bit different, but we're going to we're going to be super lazy programmers because we've already written this one before, right? So we're going to be Super lazy. Where are we going to go to copy the code for what address should look like? Where should we go to do that? Yes, exactly. Let's go to index. We'll open up users index. We'll scroll down to where the code is for that, which is right here in this block. And just copy just the PHP stuff. Don't, don't take the TD tag. Just the PHP stuff. Just the stuff I have highlighted here and hit control C So copy that code, just that address information that's in your index file. Jump back over to show, put your cursor in the middle of those two TD tags and split them apart before you paste. Make sure you're in the middle and then hit control V. I'm gonna tab this guy in so he's in line properly. And I'll close this on the side. There we go. There we go. There's our address. There's that address information. And we didn't have to type out all that code. The last one is the created on, right? Because the created on was also kind of complex. We had that date formatting idea and everything else. I mean, we've got time, though, and it probably wouldn't hurt to practice it anyways. So let's, let's, we're going to practice it. We are going to practice it. Why not? So we're going to do our inline PHP statement, right? And then we're going to use the built-in PHP date function, which looks like this. And you'll notice that my IDE, I keep thinking there's a projector over there. I go to walk over there. My IDE actually shows you what your arguments are that it's looking for. It's looking for the string format, and then it's looking for a timestamp in seconds. So what that looks like is the string format, we're going to do day, month, and year. Capital Y means four digits. I'll uh, link up the actual, like, um, I'll link up the format document so that you can see what is what and what means what. Comma, string, two, so that's S-T-R, T, 
T-O, T-I-M-E, so string to time. And what that will do is actually take a date, like a full date, and convert it into uh, epoch seconds. So it's like just a big string of time, like just a big integer. And we're going to plug into that, dollar sign, user, created at, into there. Sorry, created at, not create at. There we go. <clears throat> so once again, this is the format of the time. This is the time in seconds since, it's, I think it's from 1973 to now. So it's that time period in seconds is how it's calculated. And then it will be formatted into day, month, year. But I also want the time, um, like the actual time. That's the date. I want time as well. So I'm going to put a BR tag underneath it to create a break. And then I'm going to be super lazy. I'm going to use my IDE and I'm going to duplicate that line and just bring it down and change the format. So in your IDE, if you put your cursor anywhere on that line whatsoever and you hit Alt and Shift and then just press your arrow key to bring it down. Now I want to move it so that it's after the break tag. So I'm going to put my cursor on that line. I'm going to hold Alt this time and just press down, which allows me to move it around without duplicating it. So Alt Shift will duplicate, Alt will just move. Might not work in your IDE, no guarantee, but it does in visual code. And I believe it does in Sublime as well. And then this is gonna look a little different. This is gonna be G, which to me has no reflection in the way of hours in any way. I don't know where they get G for hours, but G. I, which represents minutes, believe it or not. And then A which represents meridian, which is like AM, PM. I might be saying that wrong. I think it's actually meridium with an M. Go ahead and save that. Jump over to your browser, hit refresh, and it should populate with the person's data. So this is Oleta Pororas. Totally looks like an Oleta Pororas who has an email, gerlach at antoinette, .com. Crazy phone number. They live in East White, Utah, Hungary. And they registered to our website on the 26th of December, 2015, at 10.33 p.m. We can see that information about them. Which is pretty cool, considering we just built this today, and they registered in the past. We broke time and space, people. We're Dr. Who. Yeah. All right, too nerdy for you, yeah? <laughs> All right, let's move in, yep, yep, cool. If you got an error, no worries, let's just finish this up and then I will help resolve errors because it takes minutes. Um, it's easier than stopping. So under the index file, we're gonna add a link so that you'll be able to jump from the index file to that page and go look at a user. And I think the best way to do that is to wrap the link around the username so that you just click on the user and then it goes straight there. So this is under users index.php. I'm gonna put this to the next line so it's a little easier to see. I'm gonna start my anchor tag up here and I'm gonna close it underneath it. So now it becomes a link and it is the text you will see in the link. In the link. So our harass or href is going to be equal to the place we currently are, so dot slash show dot php. And then this is where we get cheeky and we provided a dynamic ID. And the way we do that is we type in the question mark to tell it that we're going to pass a query parameter. We give it the key ID. We make it equal to and then we type in some raw PHP. What field am I going to give it? Exactly, ID. <laughs> Sounded like a trick question, really wasn't. <laughs> and then go ahead and save that. 
That's literally it. This name will now be a hyperlink and it will point to our show page. And when we click it, it will actually pass this ID parameter with this value in it. And notice this value is now dynamic because it will be auto-generated for every single user. <clears throat> so now if you go to your browser, is anybody still typing? Anybody still typing? No? Yeah? Okay. I'll give you a couple seconds. The rest of you, if you go to your browser and go to your users in like the index page for your users, you should see that all of the users in the table now have a hyperlink. Are we good? No? Yes? Yeah? Yes? Yeah? Okay. Has anybody ever told you before you have an uncanny resemblance to the guy, the lead singer from System of a Down? Yeah? Okay. <laughs> I'm a big fan of them. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go to users. So I'm just going to back up my stuff here to users and hit enter. So now I'm at users. Here's my big users list, right? And just check, yeah, pick a random one. I'm going to pick Isaiah Schoen. It looks kind of mopey. Mopey fellow. And if you want to go back, just click back and choose somebody else. Let's pick Deontay. Very content person. So we're not going to get to do it today, but next week we're going to create a user registration page and we're going to create our own user. And I've already added a nice little chunk of code for you that when you create the user, and you add your email, it's going to give you an avatar. It will auto-generate you an avatar. And you'll get to see what you look like in avatar form. We're also going to do password authentication and role authentication next week. So it's going to be a pretty fast-paced lesson. Um, but the end result will be us having a full registration table. When we're done, that whole piece is literally your project too, like part two. You could take that out and put that into your project. The only homework for lack of a better term that I would say, is I would work on project part one this week and attempt to get it done before the end of the week so that you know what you're building with your group, right? Make sure you choose your group members, get a strong idea of what you're gonna build. All right, that's it, that's all I've got for you.